Hello! Welcome to the first online lecture for Philosophy 478. My name is Eric Packett and I will be your instructor for this course. From time to time I'll be doing these online lectures to give you some background information or fill in some details that we don't have time to cover in class. So this first lecture is going to be on modal logic. And I'm assuming that many of you perhaps have seen some modal logic before, but if not, this, this lecture should help everybody get onto the same page. So first, let me just flag uh, three articles that give you a nice overview of the history of modal logic. So if you're interested in how the, the formalism that we're using in this course, how it developed uh, over the past 50, 60 years, uh, or even longer, especially for this uh, last Stanford Encyclopedia article, um, I would take a look at one of these articles. And in particular, this, this article by Robert Goldblatt is a very extensive overview about the development, the mathematical development of modal logic. So some of you, those who haven't seen modal logic before, may be wondering, what exactly is a modal? Why is it called modal logic? Well, in natural language, a modal is just anything that qualifies the truth of a sentence. So what do I mean by that? Let's look at a sentence. Consider the sentence, John is happy. That's a, a sentence that describes a particular state of affairs, the, the, how John is currently feeling. Uh, and a modal is any word that we can use to qualify the truth of this sentence. So for example, John might be currently happy now, but it may not be necessary that John is happy, or perhaps John is currently not happy, but it's possible that he could become happy. So John is necessarily happy. John is possibly happy. These words here, necessarily and possibly, are referred to as modals. There are other types of modals, uh, epistemic or dosastic modals. So John is known or believed or certain by some agent, say, and to be happy. Uh, there's deontic modal, John is permitted or obliged to be happy. Temporal issues or temporal modals, John is currently now happy, John will be happy at some moment in the future, John is happy at some moment in the past. Uh, action modalities, John can do something to ensure that he is happy, and so on. I'll let you think of, there are many other examples you can find in natural language. So corresponding to each of these different types of modals are different types of modal logics. One of the most extensively studied modal logics are so-called tense modal logics, where we look at modal languages that contain modalities that express temporal issues or temporal uh, concepts, henceforth, eventually, hitherto, previously, now, and so on. The main topic of this course will be to focus on epistemic and dosastic modal logics. So these are modal logics with modalities that, that represent expressions of the form, it is known or it is believed that such and such is true. Other types of modal logics, which we won't have much time to talk about in this course, deontic modal logic, uh, it is obligatory or forbidden, such and such that. Dynamic modal logics, after a program or an action finishes, then such and such is true. An interesting class of modal logics, geometric modal logics. It is locally the case within some spatial region that such and such is true. Also provability logic, so metalogic issue. So it is satisfiable or provable that such and such is true. So these are all modal logics, and they typically share a, a, a common language, but they have different interpretations. But like I said, for this course, we're going to be focusing on epistemic and dosastic modal logics. So what is, a, what is the modal language? Well, a modal logic is uh, a formula of modal logic is defined inductively uh, as follows. Well, you just take usual Boolean logic, so you start give yourself a set of atomic variables or atomic propositions, and you close off under the usual Boolean connectives. So negation, and, 
disjunction and uh, uh, implication. And you add on top of that two new unary operators, so-called box and a diamond. So these are unary operators. So uh, from formally, they're at the same level as a negation. Negation is a unary operator, whereas uh, conjunction, disjunction, and implication are binary operators because they connect two formulas. So the modal operator is simply a uh, new unary operator we add to a propositional language. So for example, these are example of formulas, uh, or this is an example of a formula in modal logic. So box P implies diamond Q, or box diamond not R. There are many different types of semantics for modal logic. I won't have time to discuss some of these more mathematically more sophisticated semantics. We're going to focus in this course on relational semantics or Kripke semantics, named after the famous American philosopher Saul Kripke, who really invented, I shouldn't, it's, it's not quite right to say invented uh, these relational semantics, because you see instances of them earlier in the literature, but certainly, uh, uh, it's, it's right to say that Kripke's paper put this, this type of semantics for modal logic on the map. All right, so let's go into uh, understand a bit more about what the relational semantics is. What exactly it, do I mean by a Kripke structure? Or a, rather than a Kripke structure, sometimes you'll call this a relational structure. So a Kripke structure or a relational structure. So the main idea is, let's say it is sunny outside is currently true. Let's suppose that it actually is sunny outside, but that's not necessary. For example, if we lived in Amsterdam, it's typically not sunny in Amsterdam. So it's certainly not necessary that it's sunny outside if we lived in Amsterdam. So we say that phi is necessary, provided that phi is true in all of the relevant situations, or as we'll say, states or possible worlds. A Kripke structure just gives you the machinery to make this idea formal. So it contains essentially two parts. A set of states or worlds, these are the possibilities that we're quantifying over, and a relation on those set of states or worlds that tells you which are the relevant situations at, at each possible state. So for example, this is a Kripke structure. We start off with a set of states. So we'll typically say W is equal to W1, W2, W3, W4, and W5. So there are five states here. Now, each of these states each state is going to be associated with a propositional valuation. So what does that mean? Well, in this, let's say we have a language that has three atomic sentences in it, A, B, and C. Now, these atomic sentences are going to be, each state is associated with a full propositional valuation, so it tells you which sentences are true or false at each state. So at W1, this means that sentence A is true here and B and C are both false. At W4, for example, B and C are both true, but A is false. So it's just the convention I'm using. If I draw the sentence letter inside of the circle, that means that the sentence is true at that state. Then on top of the set of states, we give an accessibility relation. So here we just draw, if there's an arrow going from W3 to W5, for example, we denote this by W3 is related to W5. And we'll say W3 can see W5, or W5 is accessible from W3. So that's it. This is a Kripke structure. It's, strictly speaking, this is what's called a Kripke model. A little bit more formally, a model consists of three objects, a non-empty set of states, could be finite or infinite, 
a relation, and a relation is just a set of ordered pairs, and a way of specifying <clears throat> which atomic propositions are true at which states. So the way we say that is we have a evaluation function that maps, so given any atomic proposition V, V of P is going to be the set of all states, so it's going to be a subset of W. This is equal to the set of all X, such that X is a subset of W. It's the power set of W. The set of all states where we interpret this as meaning P is true. So that's a model. Truth is defined as follows. So if we write MW models phi, that means that phi is true at state W in this model. The Boolean connectives are interpreted as you expect. So if P is an atomic sentence, so assume here P is an atomic sentence, then P is going to be true at state W just in case the valuation says it is, just in case W is an element of V of P. Not phi is true at W, just in case phi actually isn't true at W. And conjunction phi and psi is true, just in case both phi and psi are true. The remaining Boolean connectives, disjunction and implication and if and only if, are going to be defined as usual. But what we're really interested in are these two new modalities, box and diamond. Box is the necessary. This says phi is necessary. And this is going to be true just in case for all of the accessible worlds. So we're at a state W, and I want to know, is it the case that box phi is true? That's what I'm interested in. Well, I'm at the state W. I look at all of the relevant possibilities. There's going to be lots of possibilities that W can see. So V1, V2, V3, V4, V5. W might be able to see itself. Anyway, there's a whole bunch of different worlds that W can see. And we say that box phi is true just in case phi is true in all of these accessible worlds. And diamond phi is the dual of box. This is going to be true just in case there exists a possible world. There exists at least one possible world. So we'll say diamond psi. We'll switch to psi here. There is at least one possible world in which psi is true. So one accessible world in which psi is true.